going to <coughs> continue in the book of Matthew, in the first chapter. And uh, we went through to verse 9. One through nine is as far as we got. I'm going to, uh, since we just read the verse nine, I'm just going to recap this and just go over it again. It won't take long to go over it again. It starts off the historical record of Jesus Christ. All right, now the historical record, the historical record. What that is meaning is the historical record of Jesus Christ is him becoming the son of man. And just like you talked to, to Nicodemus. Try to make it very clear, very, very simple. And a lot of these people don't, don't get this fully. They don't understand this. He's going to Nicodemus who knows a lot about the scriptures, a lot. And Jesus said, you don't know these things? Well, these people don't know these things either. And said, so if you are to be in this earth, you must be born of a woman. You must be born in this earth. And so it is the same way in the kingdom of heaven. Because it's not a fleshly place, it's not a human place, it's not a, like that type of a, a body that we have. It's a spiritual place, a spiritual body. You must be born spiritually to enter into the spiritual realm, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's that simple. And it's not because someone says you're born again, it's not because you feel like you're born again. That's, that's, that doesn't make you born again. It's not that you say the sinner's prayer, or some put it, the born again prayer. But the born again prayer is not a born again prayer. You don't become born again because you say a prayer. That is up to the Lord. That is up to the Spirit of God. And who and when. And he was talking to Nicodemus about this. But I want to go back to what he says. If you're born to be in the earth, you've got to be born of a woman. You've got to be born into this earth. Now, Jesus was the only one. He was with God, been with his Father, before the creation of the world. Before, in the beginning of time, he was there by him. The prince, the prince of the universe. And he set that all aside to come down here. For us, yes. But why he did it? Because his father wanted him to. The love of his father was above all. That's why Jesus Christ receives glory now and forevermore. A name above all names. Well, that's what happened with him. The prince of the universe was to be in, on this earth. He had to be born. He had to, to be a, 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 to make himself a lowly position. To be actually born of a woman, you can imagine this, as a newborn, as a baby, as a toddler, and had to go through this. At 12 years old, started, started to expose the religious leaders and to uh, have them wonder in awe of him, and had to wait 26 more years before he started his ministry, so to speak. And why did he wait? He could have, it seemed like he could have, he could have started when he was 12, certainly 18, or in his 20s for sure. But uh, he, he only waited for one reason, because it wasn't time. 
What's that time? I, mean, I heard some brothers, a teacher, a, a Bible teacher, saying that Jesus, that he could do uh, whatever, whatever he wanted because it was going to be right. Well, I told him, well, that's not true, that's incorrect. Jesus could not do whatever he, he could do. I mean, you could say in one end he could, but then he would have been in sin. So that's not going to happen. I said, no, that's not right. And I showed him from the Word of God, more than one place, Jesus said he only does what his Father tells him to do. And he only says what his Father has him to say. They say, well, see, he said it this way because of this, or he did it this way because of this. No. No. He did what he did because his father told him to do that way. He said what he said and how he said it because that's what his father told him to do. When he got angry and made a cord of whips and turned over the lawful businessmen's tables and products, turn them over, just scatter their money across the world, uh, right on the ground. Yeah. But that's, that's what the father told him to do. And uh, When people, when people say to me, I says, well, you know, you've got to like, talk more gentle or, or more loving. And I said, oh. So I always trap them, saying, oh, do you want well, Jesus? You can agree that he was love, only love. Yes. I want to tell them that story. Well, he, what, was he love here or did he miss it here? <laughs> when he threw over businessmen, they weren't doing anything to him. They were there lawfully. Yeah, well, that was love. That was love. And when he called out the religious leaders of those days, that would be the pastors and ministers, priests of this today, called them out. Loud, loud voice. Called them out. You brood of vipers! You snakes! How is that love? Because if you don't do that, they remain out. They remain blind. They remain deaf. Thinking that they're in, teaching these people that they're in, but they're not. It's not biblical. It's not the truth. It's love. Because it shakes them up, and it's the only thing that can. The only thing that will work with, with some, especially the leaders of his people, the only thing that will work is you shake them up. And you shake them up by God's words. Right? Not physically shake them up with his words. So anyway, the historical record of Jesus Christ, that is talking about his being born of a woman, be born in his birth. That's the historical record. He's the only one that had to set aside his spiritual life. Like Enoch, he was here. Then he went. God took him. Jesus was there. He was already there. He was set. And he set it aside to come, to come to earth. And that's a historical record. The son of David. The son of Abraham. And uh, in Matthew, in Luke's genealogy, it goes all the way back to Adam. But Matthew starts with Abraham. It doesn't go past that. It does go to Adam, but he starts with Abraham. In verse 2, Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. And uh, I want to 
I didn't go. I didn't do this uh, a couple weeks ago, and, I, and the Lord shows me I need to do that. And that is about with Abraham. Why does it start with Abraham? Why does it start with someone before? It? Because the genealogy does go before, before, before Abraham. Why does it start with Abraham here in Matthew? Well, I'm going to start with the one in Luke that's before Abraham. And that is Terah, who is in the genealogy. And it says, Terah fathered Abram, Nahor and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Now, for the reason it says that Haran fathered Lot, of course, we find out that Lot went with uh, Abraham. Haran died in his native land. So Haran, the son of Terah, died early. And uh, certainly earlier than Terah, and Terah, his father, was still living. But Haran had died. But Abram's nephew was Lot. Now, Abram and Nahor took wives. Abram's wife was named Sarah. Nahor's wife was named Milcah. Sarai was unable to conceive could not have a baby, and she did not have a child. Now, who decided to leave Ur? Because they were in Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. Who is the one that led them out of there? Uh, anybody got any answers? Or, uh, or Hold your peace. <laughs> well, I'll tell you who, who led them out there. Who took them out. It was not Abram. It was Terah. It was Abram's mother. Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, Lot, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they set out together for her of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, it's the same name of his son who died, Terah's son who died. But that's not what we're talking about here. Haran is also a place. They came to Haran, they, they settled there. And Terah died in Haran. He lived uh, 205 years, but he died in Haran. But in Haran, the Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So now you see, you get, you're, you, you get to see here why it starts with Abraham. Because that's where the covenant started. The covenant started with Abraham. The, the covenant started with Abraham when he was still Abram. And so it is with any of his disciples, his true disciples, and he was elect. Yeah, that starts before you even born. It starts when you're the When you're the old you, <laughs> it starts and calls you from that point. Not to, not to be made light of. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. 
Now, Abram was 75 years old when he left here. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they accumulated, and all the people he had acquired in here. And they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem, at the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your offspring. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the, on the east. He built an altar to Yahweh there and he called on the name of Yahweh. Abram was 
and their people, their, their, their soldiers, five coming against four, coming against four kings. And I'm sure they thought that they, they're going to defeat them. Five against four. The odds are for them. And, uh, and like it says here, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim contained many asphalt pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the mountains. The four kings took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all the food, and went on. They also took Abram's nephew Lot, all his possessions. Well, you know, there were a lot of possessions, just his. For he was living in Sodom, and they went out. They took everything. Everything. But one of the survivors that escaped had told Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken prisoner, that's what he needed to hear. Lot was taken. And here, the massive army that they assembled took them all prisoners, took all their stuff. Five kings against four, but still were defeated. Abram assembled 318. And why did he assemble 318? That's all he had. Now, I'm thinking that's quite a bit for one man to have in his uh, and where he is, where he presides. 318 trained men born in his household, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he, Abram, who was, I'm not sure, but we know he's over 75 years old, and his servants deployed against them by night and attacked them. Abram was one of the ones who attacked them and pursued them. He brought back all the goods and also his relative Lot and his goods as well as the women and the other people. He got everything back. Defeated them. Five kings against four, no. Abram with 318, yes. And after Abram returned from defeating Shudder and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaba, that is the king's valley. And then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought up bread and wine. He was a priest to the God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and I give praise to God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. Abram, at seeing Melchizedek and hearing what he said, gave him a tenth of everything. Well, let's see, a tenth of a whole lot will still be a whole lot. That <laughs> won't be. A tremendous amount. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. That was the right thing to do for the king of Sodom. The absolute right thing to do. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to Yahweh, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, and no one could ever say that they've made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. Well, that was already done in 38. <laughs> but as, as for the share of the men who came with me, Aner, Eshkel, and Memer, they can take their share. Still looking on his key men and said, they, sh they should go to them. So Abram came back with less than what he had. He wouldn't take anything. 
And he gave 10% of what he had to Melchizedek. But Abram found out that the more you give and the Lord is with you, the more you get. And that's not why he did it. <laughs> that's not why he did it. Well, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. Wow. Now that is amazing. After these events, it said, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. That, I mean, imagine the Lord, that the vision coming to you, and that was to you, coming to you. Not so with Abram. Not so with Abram. He didn't think much of it. That says, but Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? What can you give me of everything you should give me? You give me the riches of the whole earth. He didn't care. He didn't care at all. What can you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram continued. <laughs> Here comes this grand vision. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But, <laughs> but, Abram said this. Then it says, Abram continued. Look, you have given me no offspring. Well, now confronted the Lord. You've given me no offering. So a slave born in my house will be my heir. Pretty much saying, Lord, appreciate it, but thanks a lot. <laughs> now the word of the Lord came to him, this one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Now after Abram was, let's just say, complaining nicely before the Lord, let's put it that way, saying his griefs, it says that Abram believed the Lord and the Lord credited to him as righteousness. He believed the Lord and there was no law. There's no rules. The word of the Lord just came to him. And Abram believed it. I mean, this time he's over 75. His wife is over 60. Never even had a child. Couldn't have children. And he believed the Lord. That's what it talks about in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abram, when he was called, obeyed and went out to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And 
then it talks about Romans 4. It says, for what does the scripture say? Uh, and I'm going to go through that here. I'm going to go back here. It says here, this is in the Genesis 15 where we're reading. It says, Abram believed the Lord and got credit to him as righteousness. And that's what it says here. Paul states in, in, in Romans 4 here, for what does the scripture say? Well, we just read it. What does the scripture say? Abram believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. His faith is credited for righteousness. It repeats that. When we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness, three times, <laughs> repeats it three times in chapter 4. For the promise to Abraham was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. And those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty. Okay. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise is canceled. For the law produces, anybody know what the law produces? The law produces wrath. And where there is no law, there's no transgression. For there's no law, there's no sin. This is why the promise is by faith, so that may be a, according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. Let's talk about me. Well, that's talking about anybody who would receive what Jesus Christ, what he did, and what he's doing now, must be received by faith. Must be received as Abraham did. That's why it says, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of Abraham's faith. He is the father of us all in God's sight. You know? We are the heir, whoever comes to him, and whoever endures to the end. In fact, I pretty much to say, pretty much we're all of Abraham's seed because it was going to be countless, countless, his, his offspring, like the dust, if you can count it. So that means so many of his offspring are not going to be entering in. But the ones who are entering in are his offspring. And it says, You're, you, whoever is his elect is of Abram's offspring because... He's the one that, that heard God and believed God just on that alone, just by faith. Not because he had to. Not because it was the law. Because that's what the Lord, the Lord gave, gave to him and, and told him, and that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. That's why it says he is the father of us all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. Genesis, the end of Genesis 15. I'm going to start with in Genesis 16. Of course, picking up in the genealogy of Matthew, 
and we've made it uh, about a quarter of the way through verse 2. So, I will pick up next time on that, starting in, 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 in the verse 2 in the first chapter of Matthew, and also the first verse of Genesis 16, which is going to continue to talk about Abram. And to God be all the glory. Praise God so much for his written word and for the living word, Jesus Christ, forever. Amen.